Good evening, everyone. My name is Carol Annett from the Sunnybrook Board of Directors, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to tonight's special speakers series event. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to continuing to provide you with great monthly lectures online and back in person at Sunnybrook when it is practical and comfortable and safe for everyone to attend. November is Diabetes Awareness Month, where healthcare communities across the country bring attention to diabetes research, education, and management. Through our session tonight, we hope to contribute by providing insight and information that can improve the quality of life for those living with diabetes. Tonight's topic is one that is frequently requested by our community members, and our panel of experts is here to offer valuable guidance and helpful recommendations. I invite you to join our mailing list to receive notification about our upcoming lectures. You can also find information on the speaker series website where you have access this evening's talk. Tonight, our presenters will be speaking about reducing complications of type two diabetes, about fats, the good, the bad, and the in-between, and also about how to take charge of your diabetes management. We really hope that the information presented resonates with you and that we can provide you with some helpful tips and resources through our discussion at the end of the session as well. To get things started, I'd like to now introduce tonight's moderator, Jill Zweig. Working in diabetes education for over 25 years, Jill is a registered dietitian with the Sunnybrook Family Health Team and a certified diabetes educator. Jill enjoys connecting with her clients to help them make living with diabetes easier. She also teaches medical students and dietetic interns and serves as a tutor for the U of T Medical School's Continuing Education, Community Population and Public Health course. So in her spare time, she also likes hiking, tennis, biking, and skiing with family and friends. And she will not have to worry because now that winter has arrived, I think snow will be coming for that skiing. We are very fortunate to have Jill guide us through our session and moderate our discussion tonight. Thank you again for all being here with us. And I'll now pass the microphone over to Jill. Thank you, Carol, for that really beautiful introduction. Good evening to you all, and thank you for joining us online this evening for our annual Diabetes Speaker Series. Tonight, our lectures in recognition of Diabetes Month, and we are very lucky to have a great lineup of Sunnybrook experts connecting with you. I also want to highlight that today, November the 14th, is World Diabetes Day. So thanks for celebrating us with us tonight. Dr. Gilbert will be speaking about type two diabetes with an update on pharmacotherapy to reduce complications. Karen Fung will be presenting fats, the good, the bad, and the in-between. And Lee Kaplan will share a presentation on how to take charge of your diabetes management. After our presentations, we'll have some time to ask, you will have some time to ask our expert panel questions about their lectures or any other related concerns you may have. Thank you to anyone who has already submitted a question online. We invite you to also send your questions to us during the session using this web page. We may not be able to get to every question, but we will do our best to answer you in the time we have available. Our first presenter this evening is the Sunnybrook physician, Dr. Jeremy Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert completed his medical degree, internal medicine training and endocrinology residency at the University of Toronto. He is the former program director for adult endocrinology and metabolism at the University of Toronto where he now serves as an associate professor. He is the endocrinology section chair at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. 
Dr. Gilbert is the national lead for the dissemination and implementation of the Diabetes Canada guidelines, where he authored chapters in the 2013 and 2018 editions. He is also a member of the steering committee for the current Diabetes Canada guidelines. A national editor for the Canadian Journal of Diabetes and a member of their executive team. Dr. Gilbert is a passionate teacher with academic interests in medical education in undergraduate and postgraduate diabetes and endocrinology studies. A recipient of numerous awards for outstanding teaching, he recently won the Canadian Society of Endocrinology and Metabolisms. Harvey Gouda, Educator of the Year Award. Congratulations. Dr. Gilbert, the microphone is yours. Well, thanks, Joel. Um, big thank you to Carol uh, on behalf of the Board of Directors and uh, to the Organizing Committee for asking me to speak. Um, I think this is my third or fourth speaker series that I've been involved with and I always enjoy the interactivity. And perhaps the best part of, you know, about it is working with my colleagues. So uh, Karen and Lee and Jill and um, the team that I work with really makes uh, taking care of people living with diabetes uh, an enjoyable practice. And um, just wanted to acknowledge their hard work and to thank them for partnering with me. Um, and a big thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, we do hope to get one day back in person, but just for safety reasons, this is probably the safest mode for now. Um, so thank you for all for participating now and those who are going to be watching this later. So without further ado, um, obviously we treat uh, with medications people living with type 2 diabetes not for fun, not for treating a number for, for treating the person. And that's what it's all about. And the idea behind it, again, is not to treat a number, but to ultimately reduce complications from diabetes. And so that's gonna be the format of my discussion. I'd like to just put all my disclosures out there. A lot of the companies that I work with help sponsor diabetes education. And so I just wanted to put that uh, disclosure slide available for everybody. And so uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, my objectives, uh, oh, I guess it got cut off, um, is really to kind of review the diabetes complications, um, the different types that there are and how we can address them. And again, we'll have an opportunity for questions. So in terms of why this is an important topic for us all to discuss this evening is we know that about 50 to 80% of people with diabetes die of a cardiovascular event. So this is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. As well, the number one cause of dialysis in Canada is diabetes. So a lot of kidney related disease. We know that diabetes is the number one reason for amputations other than trauma in Canada. Since 1998 for men and women, the number one reason that somebody with diabetes will be admitted to hospital is actually heart failure. So heart failure is an important complication. And stroke is much more common in people with diabetes. And diabetes is the number one reason for working age adults to have blindness. So bottom line is diabetes is a chronic condition with a lot of complications. And our objectives together um, is to try and help reduce those complications, prevent them from happening, or if they do happen, to try and make them more manageable. So this is just to illustrate how common um, kidney disease is. And in particular, in the dark blue at the top is diabetes-related kidney disease. So when you compare that to other types of kidney disease, you see that diabetes is by far more common as a contributing factor to end-stage renal disease. So what can we do to reduce the progression of diabetic kidney disease? So one is controlling blood sugars. So when we control blood sugars, uh, that is one of the most effective ways of reducing kidney disease. And there's a variety of ways of doing that, lifestyle modification with appropriate diet and exercise. And Karen's gonna give us some insight into some of the healthier fats to choose from. 
and as well as pharmacotherapy. So certain medications that help lower um, sugar in a safe way. Optimizing blood pressure. So for most people with diabetes, we aim for less than 130 over 80. And using certain medications that have been shown to slow the progression of diabetic kidney disease, like ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and SJ2 inhibitors. So those would be three classes of medications that would be very important for kidney disease. When we talk about neuropathy, this is a very, very common complication of diabetes. So about 40 to 50% of people will develop detectable neuropathy within 10 years of diagnosis of diabetes. And the most common is sensory motor polyneuropathy. That's probably the most common. And usually that would manifest by somebody saying that they might have numbness or tingling in their feet, or they don't, uh, feet, they, they've lost sensation in their feet, those kind of symptoms. And although that neuropathy can be a painful, um, bothersome, uh, annoying, disruptive, what can make it even worse is that it poses a higher risk for foot ulceration and amputation. The pain can be debilitating uh, and it can affect mobility, thereby giving significant morbidity. And often people who have significant neuropathy often require a lot of healthcare resources and help, uh, which can get quite expensive. So the risk factors for neuropathy are high sugars, high triglycerides, which is a type of fat, high BMI, so that's like obesity or being overweight, smoking, and high blood pressure. So you can see that some of these risk factors can be modified. If we can lower sugar, lower triglycerides, lower weight, not smoke, and control blood pressure, that could help address neuropathy. So I show on this diagram a picture of where neuropathy is most common. And the one that I was referring to is in picture A. So most people will start complaining of something like uh, burning or numbness or tingling or something in their feet. And then it kind of spreads up what we call a glove and stocking distribution. And then it kind of descends up like that. But it's not the only type. So there's some that can be a radiculopathy. This is often uh, mimics something like sciatica, where it's kind of off the spinal cord, a nerve off the spinal cord. Or you can have one single nerve knocked off. Like here, there's a little nerve, or there, there was a nerve, or here, there was a nerve. That's what we call a mononeuropathy. And then sometimes it uh, manifests as autonomic neuropathy, which is a kind of like a whole separate set of the nervous system. And some people there may experience uh, stomach issues or bladder issues uh, as part of a neuropathy that affects the autonomic nervous system. For those who have significant pain from the neuropathy, there's certain classes of medications that we recommend. So you might uh, be started on a medication like Lyra Lyrica or Gabapentin. These are some of the common ones. We do try and avoid opioids at all costs, given um, the side effects and dependency. And remember that the goal of these medications are not to solve the problem. Now, a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I'm on them, but it's still bothersome. Our goal is really just to make it more manageable. So um, it's not going to solve the problem. And I remind everybody that glycemic control, controlling the sugars, is the only disease-modifying treatment. That's really the only thing that actually changes the condition itself. Now, foot care is a shared responsibility, which is, again, why it's important to discuss this in speaker series. Because, yeah, as a healthcare professional, I'm going to be looking at the feet and examining it and seeing if there's any issues to address. But the person who lives with diabetes lives with their feet all the time. I might see the person every three months or so, or every six months. They're living with it all the time. So they need to be screening their feet as well. Now, as I said, I'm gonna, as healthcare professionals, and that includes all the people here, Karen, Jill, Lee, myself, we all understand that this is important to screen. And when we're screening, we're looking for abnormalities in the structure of the feet for that neuropathy that I discussed for peripheral vascular disease or ulcerations or infection. And sometimes we will refer people on to certain professionals that are trained in the foot and, and its care. Um, but I do remind people that they should be looking at their feet as well for any abnormalities, ulcers or sores or calluses, and let their healthcare professional know if there's a concern. As we showed before, in terms of risk factors, advising people to stop smoking is very, very important. And should an ulcer actually develop, often this requires a multidisciplinary team to address. So just for some pictures, not to gross people out, 
But just to show you, so this was somebody who had poor sensation in their feet. This is their heel. And this person stepped on a needle and um, they didn't feel it. And the, the you know, they somebody noticed that there was like a bump on their foot and didn't feel right and didn't look right. And so they went for an x-ray and they found that. And so, you know, over the course of time, there's been a lot of very interesting things that people have stepped on very unfortunately because they had poor sensation and it can be a high risk for burns and other things. So just here's some other uh, things that we've seen that people have stepped on and got, uh, you know, which could lead to significant infections in the feet. So uh, quite a concern. So foot care is really an important complication that requires a shared responsibility to address. The next complication to discuss is retinopathy or the eyes. Um, we do recommend that people uh, see an eye specialist, or that could be an optometrist or an ophthalmologist every one to two years. Um, now, a lot of uh, people that I see in my clinic, they'll say, well, I don't have any problem with my vision. My vision's fine. And that may be fair enough. They may uh, see well, but there could be effects of diabetes on the back of the eye that they don't know about which is why it's so important that they go for the screening, even if they don't have any symptoms. So you can see on the upper left-hand corner, uh, this would be mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. That's how it would be labeled um, because there are some small, tiny aneurysms that are developed at the back of the eye, but it's still in the mild to moderate stage. Well, here it's a little bit more involved and you can see um, perhaps over here that there's a little bit more involvement in the red uh, blotches that are there. Um, this is now called proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which is quite scary. That's where new vessels are being formed and those vessels are abnormal and they can easily tear and bleed. So you can see some bleeding here at the back of the eye, uh, which could lead to significant problems. And finally, there's macular edema. So you can see these yellow deposits on the back of the eye. Uh, and that's abnormal as well. So the screening is really important. So screening can reduce the risk of blindness substantially. Um, and retinopathy is common, not quite as common as neuropathy, but still quite common. So a reminder to all of you to make sure that you are getting to that eye doctor every one to two years uh, with type 2 diabetes. So how do we address retinopathy? And this is from our guidelines. So we target an A1C less than 7%. So again, coming back to that sugar control, which is a theme you've heard already this evening, blood pressure control to target a blood pressure less than 130 over 80. And there is some evidence for certain uh, lipid lowering medications. Although this is less commonly used, uh, it's also described. If a person should get retinopathy, there's different treatments. So when I was a resident, the standard treatment was laser therapy to the eye, but now that's done much, much less frequently. And there are certain agents uh, that are put into the eye, injectable agents, uh, which sounds quite disturbing, but actually is not so bad, um, that help address those new vessel formations and has been fantastic uh, for people. It's really helped people's eye vision be preserved. And finally, there's certain surgeries that can be done. Now for macrovascular disease, those are the larger vessels. So, so far we've talked about um, the kidney, we've talked about the nervous system and the eyes. Those are small vessel disease. Macrovascular disease stands for big vessels, and those would include coronary artery disease, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease. And there's a similar approach for all three. And what we talk about here is the ABCDEs of diabetes. So if you take one message away, remember your ABCDEs. A for A1C less than 7%, B for blood pressure less than 130 over 80, C for cholesterol with an LDL, bad cholesterol under two, D for certain drugs to protect the heart, E for exercise and healthy eating. Thank you to Lee, Karen, and Jill, and smoking cessation. So in terms of drugs to protect the heart, which was one of the uh, objectives for this evening talk, let me describe that in a little bit more detail. So our guidelines state specifically that certain classes of agents are indicated for people living with type 2 diabetes to help reduce vascular disease. So some of these classes include ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and that should be given to anybody with clinical cardiovascular disease, age over 55 with certain other features like protein in their urine, eye disease, or enlarged uh, heart, or anybody with microvascular disease. So that's kidney disease, eye disease, or nerve disease. 
some of the medications you might have heard of, like Prindapril or Coversil, Ramipril or Altase or Telmosartan or Myocardis, these are agents that have been shown to offer vascular protection. Statins like Lipitor and Crestor should are also been shown to reduce heart disease by 25 to 30% in people living with type 2 diabetes. That's been shown for people who have cardiovascular disease or just having diabetes over the age of 40, microvascular complications, like we said, or if they've had diabetes over 15 years worth of time and their age is over 30. And finally, if our Canadian lipid guidelines recommend it, then they should also be used. Now, aspirin is a little bit more controversial. So aspirin is recommended if somebody's actually had a cardiovascular event. So they had a heart attack, had a stroke, had an angioplasty, then we would recommend using aspirin, but we don't use it routinely if somebody has not yet had an event. Now, our Diabetes Canada guidelines do generally recommend starting with metformin, and our goal is to try to get the A1C in target within three to six months. Now, if the A1C is quite high, uh, we do adjust or advance therapy to try and get to that A1C target sooner rather than later. If people have certain established risk factors, so they have already cardiovascular disease or kidney disease or heart failure, or their age is over 60 with risk factors, there's certain classes of diabetes agents that are recommended, even if the sugars are pretty good, because these agents have been shown to reduce those complications further. So these include SGO2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, medications like Jardians or Forziga or Invocana or Ozempic or Trulicity would be examples of these agents. So we do look at the population, the person who's in front of us and the outcome that we're trying to prevent, and we use these agents accordingly. Now, for those people who are not in that category, meaning they aren't in those high-risk populations, but their sugars are still elevated, we still do recommend those classes of agents because they help with weight loss, which is important in type 2 diabetes, and have been shown to have cardiovascular benefit in high-risk groups. So when we talk about those two classes, the SJ2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, there are some important a practical considerations that help us decide which ones to use. So I've shown you the classes. So on the on the far left, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and dabagliflozin are the SG2 inhibitors. Lyra, Sema, and Dula are our GLP-1 receptor agonists. These are generally injectable, and those are oral agents. And these injectable therapies like semaglutide or dulaglutide, that's ozempic and chelicity, can be given once a week. Uh, we dose them, as you can see here. Uh, generally, we start at a lower dose and titrate up for the injectable therapies. And cost is important. The good news is in Ontario, the SG2 inhibitors are covered by ODB and ODSP, uh, as is Ozempic, and most of the private drug plans do offer coverage. Generally speaking, the SG2 inhibitors are less expensive than the GLP-1 receptor agonists. We do have different indications based upon kidney function when we use these agents. So you may find that the prescriber may be adjusting these medications based upon the kidney function. Now, the class of SG2 inhibitors can predispose to certain side effects. So it's not only the benefit that the SG2 inhibitors have. The benefit, by the way, of the SG2 inhibitors include lowering the sugars, lowering blood pressure, lowering weight, good for the heart and heart failure and kidney disease, but they can increase the risk for yeast infections more commonly in women than men. Um, so that's an important side effect to remember. The other complications are fairly rare. With the GLP-1 receptor agonist, the most common side effect would be nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, which um, when you use the agents at a low dose and titrate them up slowly can give you less side effects. They don't cause very low sugars like insulin does. There's some rare cases of gallstone disease, some concerns about pancreatitis, but the reality is we actually haven't seen an actual cause and effect of these agents causing pancreatitis. Uh, we don't use them if they have medullary thyroid cancer, but they can be used for other types of thyroid cancer if present. 
as we've never seen GLP-1 receptor agonists causing medullary thyroid cancer in humans, only in rodents. So as long as you're human, you should be okay. There was some concerns about eye disease, but that was generally in those people who had a very rapid A1C lowering, and we don't really do that because we titrate the dose slowly. One of the nice things about the GLP-1 receptor agonist is the weight loss that can occur. Very important to reduce insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. And some people ask me, you know, is it from all that GI upset that causes it? And no, no, it's not. Even if people don't have the stomach upset, it works centrally on the brain to suppress appetite. So people aren't as hungry and that's why they lose weight. So to summarize, there's a lot of complications of diabetes, but the good news is there's something that can be done. Now we can't modify things that we can't change. You can't change your genetics, who your parents are, your age. So don't focus on that. Focus on what we can modify, things like smoking cessation, healthy diet, exercise, and taking agents and medications that have been shown to reduce vascular disease. There are strategies that are available to help reduce risk. Speak to your healthcare team, and I use that word liberally. It's a team work uh, as you can see this evening. And there's many things you can do, right? So ensuring that your foot is looked after, making sure you go for eye exams, getting your uh, blood work done, urine tests, monitoring sugars when appropriate, the lifestyle changes that Karen and Lee are gonna discuss with you and taking the appropriate medications. And in particular, the great news today is that we now have medications in our arsenal that have been shown to not only lower sugars, but ultimately, result in less complications for people living with diabetes. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm gonna turn it back to Jill. I put up this quote by my good friend Herzl Gerstein, who's um, an endocrinologist and the division head at McMaster. And I love what he says because he says, neither evidence or clinical judgment alone is sufficient, right? So, it, it, you know, it, hearing what I've said today, I hope to be evidence-based, but Evidence without any judgment can be applied by a robot or a technician. A judgment without any evidence can be applied by a friend or when you Google something. What do we hope is the integration of evidence and judgment together is what the healthcare provider does to give you the best clinical care. So hopefully um, that's what you've gleaned from this evening. And as I said, I'm happy to uh, take any questions uh, at the end. Thank you, Jeremy, for an excellent talk. Um, I really liked how you talked about sort of medication, early screening, and those are just some of the tools along with what Lee and Karen are going to talk about in terms of lifestyle to help prevent um, complications and if they catch them early and treat them appropriately by a combination of all the tools that we need to manage diabetes successfully. So thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, and that's uh, Karen, Karen Fung. Karen is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator with the Sunnybrook Academic Family Health Team and SUNDEC, which stands for Sunnybrook Diabetes Education Center. Her focus is to provide practical nutrition information to the outpatient community setting with particular interests in diabetes, weight management, and elderly nutrition. Being bilingual, Karen is also passionate about advocating for patient health and education in the Chinese communities of Toronto and the GTA. Karen completed her studies in dietetics at McGill University and also holds a Bachelor of Medical Sciences degree from Western University. Outside of work, she enjoys experimenting with food and we know she loves coffee. Over to you, Karen. Thanks for the introduction, Jill. Uh, very quickly going to just share my screen here. All right, so today I wanted to take this time to shift the focus kind of in, in succession to what Dr. Gilbert was mentioning around the complications. We're talking about the macrovascular complications and what we can do about it dietary wise. So today um, also uh, I sort of wanted to discuss this a little bit more because there was an update in the lipid guidelines in the last year. And uh, I thought it was a great, uh, 
time to shift our focus away from uh, carbohydrates and, and, you know, being on very, very, very low carbohydrate diets and into talking about fats and have the current nutrition recommendations around keeping our hearts and bodies healthy while managing our diabetes. And so by the end of the session, I'm hoping that you'll be able to identify all the nutrients that are important in uh, managing cardiovascular health, understand how the recent food trends can impact the management of diabetes and cardiovascular uh, health, and also choose some foods that are beneficial for your heart health and diabetes management in a way that fits your own lifestyle. So I want you to think about these two different menus or breakfasts and uh, consider which one you would choose and in particular, more importantly, which one you think is healthier and why. What nutrients is it that we're more concerned about? Why are they healthy for us? What maybe risks they're bringing to our health? And so keep this in mind because I think I'm going to hit a couple of the, the pointers that you're, you're considering and some of the um, factors that you're, you're thinking about right now. So in combination to what Dr. Gilbert had mentioned to us, we really are concerned about uh, the risk factors and, and the um, complications of diabetes and heart disease is, is a really major one as was highlighted. And so I wanted to just uh, review a little bit about the heart disease and its relation to cholesterol and why we should care. So on the left, we see a, a very healthy artery where the blood is flowing very nicely and very well without any um, obstructions and, and, and distractions. And then on the right side, we have our artery where there's a uh, plaque forming on the side. And this is uh, done, or the process of this is called uh, atherosclerosis. And what really contributes to this is um, certain molecules, which we also heard about from Dr. Gilbert's uh, discussion, which is LDL uh, cholesterol, which is our bad cholesterol. And when these levels are very high in our bloodstream, they can infiltrate the side of our vessels and they can form these plaques, which end up causing a little bit more of a narrowing in our arteries. Um, and it can affect our blood flow, which can raise our blood pressure. And the more dangerous side of things is when our heart is pumping very uh, hard to try and push the blood through, bits of these can break off and, and end up stuck in our smaller vessels, which uh, fuel our heart and our brain, which can then lead to things like stroke and, and heart attacks, which are the things that we want to avoid, the complications, of the macrovascular complications of diabetes. Another molecule I wanted to introduce also is the HDL, which is the good cholesterol. And what these really do is they recycle and kind of regulate the LDL in our bloodstream, the bad cholesterol. So they don't spend as much time in the bloodstream to cause that infiltration and potentially that damage to our blood vessels. So these are two molecules I want you to um, consider when we're about to jump into talking about fats. Fats, we now know there's many different types. There's um, fats that we want to be careful of and fats that we want to be um, maybe consuming a little bit more. So the three major types are trans fats, saturated fats, and unsaturated fats. Trans fats uh, are sort of the fats that we want to be really careful about eliminating and definitely limiting to very small amounts. The reason being they raise our LDL, that bad cholesterol that infiltrates the side of our blood vessels and cause those plaque buildups, and they lower our HDL, our good cholesterol that's supposed to help regulate the LDL in our bloodstream. Trans fats are often found in hydrogenated vegetable oil, oils, fast foods, pastries, and desserts, as well as deep fried foods. So we definitely want to be careful how much of these foods we're consuming and how often. Saturated fats, we actually do need some saturated fats in our eating and in our diet. Um, they come in two major sources, predominantly from the animal sources from, uh, for example, our red meats. So the visible white parts and the fats that we see from marbling is, is a source of saturated fat from underneath the, the skin of our poultry, like our chicken and our turkey, from butter, from ghee, full fat dairy as well. There's also some plant sources of uh, saturated fats too, which come from coconut oil and palm oil. And saturated fats, too much of this in our diet can be detrimental to our heart health because they also can raise our LDL, the bad cholesterol. 
And so we want to limit, not eliminate, but limit how much of these we're getting throughout our week uh, and make sure that we're choosing a leaner version of proteins as well. And finally, we have our unsaturated fats, or many of us are referring to these as our healthy fats, which are broken down into two different categories, the polyunsaturated and monounsaturated. And really, it's just a distinction between how many kinks or bends there are in the structure of, of the uh, fatty acid, but both are really helpful in lowering the LDL now. So our unsaturated fats are lowering um, the, the molecule that uh, would sort of cause a little bit more damage in that heart healthy picture. Uh, of note, the salmon, trout, sardines, tuna, mackerel, these are our fatty fish and they contain uh, a particular uh, unsaturated fat called omega-3, which is one that we have to um, get from eating foods. We can't convert it from other omegas. And also our plant versions of these omegas are flax seeds, chia seeds, and hemp seeds. Um, monounsaturated fats, uh, we can find these in our olive oils, canola oils, uh, and olives as well, avocados, avocado oils, our nuts and seeds, and their oils and uh, nut butters and seed butters. So unsaturated fats or healthy fats we want to have and include regularly because they help lower our LDL. Saturated fats we want to limit, uh, not have too much, but have small amounts. Um, as they too much of it can raise our LDL and the trans fats we really want to eliminate as much as possible because they raise our LDL and they lower our HDL, our good cholesterol. But there is some good news. The good news is that um, trans fats has actually been removed from our supply or our food supply as of September 2020. Um, it was an initiative that had started in 2017 and started phasing in where uh, artificial or industrial manufactured trans fats are uh, banned from, the, the, from it being imported into Canada and being made within the, the Canadian um, food industry. So by September 2020, there are actually no more uh, artificially made trans fats in our food, which is one less thing to think about, but it's helpful to understand why that came into play. I feel like we can't talk about managing diabetes, managing uh, heart health, and, and, and uh, talking about fats and nutrition without discussing keto very quickly. It's been very popular for many people to uh, talk about keto or to think about keto because they are very effective in lowering blood sugar. Okay. You're essentially dropping uh, a lot of the carbohydrates that you're uh, taking in. And so your blood sugars would drop as well, but many people find it really difficult to stay on keto. And as a result, then your blood sugars can also bump back up and increase back again. So, you know, something to consider how long are you able to, to keep certain, um, uh, lifestyle uh, choices in play. Uh, one thing to mention about keto is actually 85% of the calories in a ketogenic diet would come from fats and only 15% would come from proteins. And then of course, very little, less than 1% from carbohydrates. But many people were actually adopting a, an alternate version of keto and something more like Atkins where they were consuming more foods, uh, more calories from proteins, more like 20 to 30% calorie from protein, and then a little bit less in fat. And the, the problem with this was that people who would do this would end up eating more of the animal proteins. So meats, uh, red meats, uh, chicken, of course, and, and other animal sources of protein, which led to higher uh, intake of the saturated fats, the ones that would raise our LDL. So it's sort of um, more detrimental around our cardiovascular health, right? We might not be considering that. Um, so if keto is something of discussion or you're curious about it, definitely seek some advice from a, a health professional. Um, of course, being biased as a dietitian, you know, do seek some help or some advice uh, from a dietitian or nutritionist. And um, considering that the types of fats that we want to include if we are interested in, in more keto or lower carb diets would be from uh, healthy fats, as I discussed before. We are not suggesting that we go uh, on a low carb diet at all because there are many side effects uh, that might be considered. But of course, I want to give that information out there. Constipation is one where essentially removing a lot of fibers from our 
food by not having any fruits, which is a major source of carbohydrates, not having whole grains, another major source of uh, fiber, uh, as well as legumes and some vegetables uh, need to be sort of looked at in terms of the amount preference. You know, not everybody likes to have lots of uh, fat um, um, from uh, their diet, right? And also uh, medications really need to be looked at because people living with diabetes might be on certain medications that have a, a low blood sugar risk or a hypoglycemia risk. So does need to, uh, we do need to take good care if we are uh, thinking about this type of eating. I also wanted to take some time to talk about dairy because that's always a question that's asked, you know, what about it? We, the reason that is, is because the fats in dairy products are saturated. So are we supposed to have them and should we have them? One thing I like to highlight is that dairy is a very important source of calcium and they are a source of protein. From what I can uh, find from the most up-to-date evidence is that there is not a significant effect on cardiovascular health when we are choosing dairy products that are minimally processed at a moderate amount uh, and, and frequency. So we're not, you know, uh, overdoing it, so to speak. Um, and there may be some suggestions around reducing the risk of developing type two diabetes in particular with two types of products of dairy, which is the low fat milk and the yogurt. So the, the evidence is still a little bit, um, we still need to look more into it, but certainly there are some theories around why this might happen. When we might be using less refined carbohydrates uh, when we're choosing more of the dairy products um, and potentially having more protein. And so that could help uh, change up our blood sugars um, so that you know we're preventing the risk of developing diabetes, uh, type two diabetes. So the bottom line is we can safely include some minimally processed dairy moderately into our regular eating and into our diet. So to recap, uh, some foods of uh, note that we want to consider for our cholesterol and cardiovascular health are healthy fats coming from things like nuts and seeds, our plant oils, avocados, uh, our fatty fish like salmon and trout and sardines. And also another nutrient that I hadn't touched on, which is the soluble fiber, um, which also help lower LDL. Predominantly, we can find soluble fiber from whole grains such as oats and barley, as well as from legumes such as um, beans, lentils, and chickpeas. And in an overlap in terms of managing our diabetes and blood sugar control, we really uh, encourage the balanced food sort of um, approach in, in terms of a meal. Uh, we want to include proteins, we want to include fats, we want to include uh, higher fiber types of carbohydrates and, and also the, the fiber from vegetables and fruits. Um, in terms of uh, stabilizing our blood sugar as well, we want to choose higher fiber versions of carbohydrates, minimally processed. So as much whole grain, intact whole grain as, as we can, things like quinoa or brown rice, wild rice, um, and often mixing them with uh, sort of the refined version is a great way to still uh, enjoy those foods and the taste, um, uh, especially if we're living with other people who don't have diabetes and might not need to be as, um, uh, you know, careful with their uh, food and, 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 and the blood sugar control. And finally, we want to consider lower glycemic index carbohydrates, which uh, we would find are the whole grains and legumes and uh, some of the fruits as well. Uh, and so we see a lot of this overlap between keeping heart healthy, but also managing our blood sugars. So I hope that that's helpful uh, in terms of what foods to choose more often and what nutrients to, to pay attention to. I wanted to also mention about the plant forward eating and plant-based eating because it really is uh, picking up some popularity in the last couple of years. We understand that there is good benefits for managing cholesterol and to lowering blood pressure with plant-based eating. Um, and they could be uh, associated with a lower risk of developing diabetes as well. And we have seen uh, lots of uh, evidence around uh, improving our A1C and insulin sensitivity, but of course we wanna account for the amount of carbohydrate that we're having. So just because um, a food can, uh, is shown to lower your blood pressure or cholesterol doesn't mean that we can just have lots uh, of it at one time, right? So the amount per meal or per uh, eating opportunity is really important. 
Um, and so a lot of people are trying to adopt more plant-based uh, foods and plant-based proteins into their everyday life. I took this from um, one of our new sessions uh, about plant-based eating that Sundeck has, has offered. Um, and the major plant-based protein uh, sources that we're looking at is legumes, which I've talked about and their benefits of um, helping stabilize the blood sugars because of their high uh, uh, fiber intake uh, 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 amount, as well as their heart healthy benefits. Um, some soy foods such as tofu, tempeh, soy milk are also a good source of protein. And soy milk is in fact the uh, plant-based equivalent to um, cow's milk uh, because they're more uh, similar in terms of the protein content. And of course, our nuts and our seeds uh, can also provide some plant-based protein. Um, and there, we also have learned today that they are really good sources of healthy fats that would help protect our heart as well. One caution I want to mention about uh, the plant-based foods is that because of this popularity, there's been a lot more uh, products that are out there that are very processed. So we want to consider, um, you know, choosing carefully where we're getting these uh, plant proteins. And uh, I want to mention that there are some studies that are looking at um, whether the ultra processed foods uh, and, and diabetes have any relationships. And we're really wanting us to be careful around uh, the some of the, the misconceptions around plant-based foods, especially when they're, they're very processed. For example, this is one of the plant-based foods that are out there that is a processed package that you can buy at the grocery store and in the freezer or at the um, fridge area. And we see that the, actually the saturated fat is quite high and the sodium is quite high, which isn't something that we might expect from a plant-based food, seeing as how a lot of the saturated fats usually come from uh, animal sources. So be careful about uh, highly processed foods. So in summary, uh, I want to mention those two nutrients that are really heart healthy, our soluble fiber coming from whole grains and legumes, and our healthy fats that uh, predominantly come from nuts and seeds, our oils and avocados, fatty fish. Um, both of these help sort of um, modulate and stabilize our blood sugars when eaten with uh, sort of our, our healthy uh, meal balanced plate model, as well as uh, our very heart protective. Uh, we can't forget managing our blood sugars have to do with portion control and balance, which is really highlighted in Canada's food guide and many of our balanced plate uh, models. And in terms of heart healthy um, uh, strategies, we wanna include more variety, for example, different uh, plant, uh, proteins, such as plant proteins or other lean proteins into our regular eating. So I hope that gives us a bit of a refresher on uh, cardiovascular health and nutrition, and I um, hope that was helpful. Thank you, Karen. That was great. And just a good overview of healthy eating, healthy fats, you know, reducing those saturated fats where we can. Um, I'm so glad to hear that the trans fats are no longer um, added to foods. So that's really a welcome change to um, hopefully make healthy eating a little easier. And of course, always pulling it together with, you know, understanding a little bit about what you're eating, portion control and, and creating a healthy balance to enjoy um, food in the context of, of healthy living. So thank you for that. Our final speaker this evening is Lee Kaplan. Lee has worked as a certified diabetes nurse educator for over 25 years in a variety of settings with a diverse population of clients and healthcare providers. I have been fortunate to work with Lee for many of those years and respect all of her knowledge and energy. To share with you, Lee has recently won Diabetes Educator of the Year Award. So I just want to congratulate her on that. As part of the Sunnybrook Academic Family Health Team, she has been involved in the expansion of the diabetes program and interprofessional team and continues to be hard uh, involved in local and provincial committees to improve the care of all people living with diabetes. Lee enjoys working with clients so that they can live life with diabetes to their fullest. Outside of work, Lee likes to take long walks with her dog, Jenny, and spend time with family trying new activities. She's recently into rowing. 
Lee, the microphone is yours. Thanks, Jill. Um, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to meet with you virtually this evening to discuss the idea of how to take charge of your diabetes management. And you've heard a lot of information today, and it's sort of how do you take that information? And that's why I put this picture of this woman juggling on top of an elephant who's on top of a ball on a tightrope, because sometimes it can feel that way when we're trying to take in new information, apply new medications, understand. It's a lot of things. And I'm hoping that as we try to find balance, that we can make it more manageable for everybody. Okay. So my objectives for tonight are by the end of this session, participants will be able to understand the roles of the person with diabetes and the healthcare team, state how to set a SMART goal and recognize how being imperfect can move you forward in diabetes management. So I wanted to remind everyone, we have guidelines that uh, were last published in 2018 and new ones are coming in 2013, uh, 2023, sorry, I don't know where I got 2013, 2023. And um, what's really important is that they've involved people with diabetes um, in the development. And uh, so people were, we looked over these guidelines, decided what was being said, looked at all the evidence. And I think that for us, this uh, chapter is gonna be very important tonight as I speak around self-management and support, which is the chapter name. And what the definition is, is a systematic intervention that involves active participation by the individual with diabetes in self-monitoring of health parameters and or decision-making with the application of knowledge and skills. When you look and review this chapter, uh, what you can find is that um, when someone has diabetes, just as I talked about that elephant and juggling on top of it, is that there are so many things that you have to manage while you're dealing with diabetes. And this can involve a lot of different frequent different self-adjustments being done. I think to be able to really understand self-management and what's involved there is a couple of uh, pieces need to be told to you is that 90% of self-care is, 90% of diabetes care is self-care. Um, research has shown that people who are involved in improving their self-management have been shown to have reduced reducing in A1Cs, improvement in cardiovascular risk factors, and even reduction in foot ulcers, infections, and amputations. It also can, by improving uh, your self-management skills, it also can improve your self-efficacy. So your strength in seeing that you have the ability to be able to make behavior change. So it's important to look at how you get yourself more engaged in your management. Well, I don't know about you, but when I look at all the things that you do as a person with diabetes, as a self-manager, it can be sometimes very overwhelming. And I only put one meal down. Uh, you know, you're cooking, making decisions about three meals a day with snacks. You're adding in exercise. Where do you add it in? You've got to get to the, get to the lab work done so that you can have a really good discussion with your endocrinologist when you sit down with them. You need to, as Dr. Gilbert talked about, is taking care of your feet besides when the, um, your healthcare provider might do that. Sorry, I don't know. I went out of Sorry about that. Let me go back in. Um, okay. So there's a lot to be done and um, there's a lot to cover in your diabetes management, but you always have choices of what you want to focus on and what you actually want to do.
So as um, there is a book called The Art of Empowerment written by some Diabetes educators called Martha Martha Funnel and Bob Anderson, and they looked at these choices. And what I've heard Martha Funnel speak, and she says, you have you can be an engaged self manager, or you can choose to sit on the couch and do nothing. What you need to know is whatever choice you choose is what you need to remember is that you live with the consequences of your choice. So the first thing I'd like to debunk is that <laughs> perfection, it's overrated. Um, it's especially hard to thrive for perfection in managing a chronic condition such as diabetes. The problem is trying to achieve perfection is either impossible or impossible to continue. I would suggest that you might want to consider looking at it as progress versus perfection. I always think of the game of perfection as a kid where you were put on a timer and you had to put these pieces in. And then if the pieces, if the timer went off and all the pieces weren't in, they would explode into the air. And it was like um, everything was out of control. And sometimes that can, when you're striving for perfection, that's what it can feel like with diabetes management. So where do we go? And what do, if we're not gonna look at perfection, when, when we're thinking about our management, what should we consider? How do we move ourselves forward? Someone in my world suggested looking for your purpose versus your perfection. No, this doesn't make it easier since sometimes you're not sure what your purpose is in managing your diabetes and people get stuck with the planning of their purpose and can't get over that planning stage to be able to do it. I'm wondering if another approach could be just taking smaller steps, which can help you take charge. Remember, with these steps, you'll ex expect setbacks along the way as part of the journey, but you're moving forward and learning as you go to find what behavior changes work for you or need to be adapted to work better for you. So I went looking and I was trying to think of what, what, could, what would be a good way to look at this a little bit differently. And I thought this might resonate with some of you. So another option for managing your diabetes, which I'm going to introduce you to, is the plan, do, check, and adjust cycle, which has been used a lot in industry. It's used in healthcare. Um, the PDCA cycle is used for quality and continuous improvement. So when reading up on this cycle, it said you should it should be used when you want to start a new improvement project. So I thought, what better project than improving your diabetes management skills? So you would plan, recognize the opportunity and plan for change. The idea of a plan is that you plan and then you move into doing. You don't wanna just stay in the planning stage. Once you, you have the plan, you break it down into a few small steps, such as a SMART goal, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. And then you would go and you would test it, see how that works and do a check-in in one to two weeks to, and analyze the data that you got and identify what you learned. So for example, say you were actually you know, you decided to exercise seven days a week and you found you exercised only two because life was busy. Life got in the way. So you've done the activity. You now check and you make an adjustment. So maybe it's three times a week for 15 minutes, but it fits now into your life. And there's so many other behavioral changes that we could make work for this. So if we're going to make a plan, I think one of the, a very good way to start is with a SMART goal. And I would say that using the, the SMART uh, goal algorithm here, we're going to look at it. And I've written one on the side. We want the SMART, the, the S of the SMART is going to be specific. 
we're looking at making it as specific as possible so that it actually works for you. And the tendency is sometimes we'll say, oh, I want to get healthy. Well, there's no behavior with that. And with a goal, with a SMART goal, we want it to have a behavior to it. We want it to be measurable. The more measurable, the better, that we actually have a specific what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, and for how long. And making it achievable. It's a bonus if you get a couple extra um, walks in in a week, if you're only walking three times a week. But it allows you to, uh, you've definitely met your goal. It's been realistic. And when we're talking goals, we don't want to go past one to two weeks because they get too far away from us. So the one that I've written down here is I will eat half a plate of vegetables at dinner three times, picking the days, even more specific, Monday, Thursday, and Sunday for the next week. What I bolded here was the word will. The tendency sometimes is to say, I will try. And if you have to try, it's probably not realistic. So it might be taking a little bit, maybe one night out if it was looking at vegetables or, um, you know, maybe it's a third of a plate because it can't get to half yet. Um, so there's many ways that you can adapt it. Once you've got it, then I say to you, once you've Say it out loud, say it out loud to a friend, write it down on a piece of paper. It becomes more doable. You've said it, you've heard your commitment. Someone else has heard you do that. So that can be our plan. And now we need to go into our doing. So I just want to share with you that sometimes, where do I write this down? How do I find a place to put it on? And Diabetes Canada has a few tools in their uh, resource list at their website. And one of them is actually this tool. That is, you can write down the goals you have, and we talked about making them specific. So you can see that exercising, walking for 30 minutes, three times a week, eating healthy, replacing regular snacks with vegetables three days a week. So you see the specifics. And they even have it where they've decided to even make it more specific to the actual time of day that they're doing it. This is a great tool that's available to everybody. Sometimes, you know, we already talked, we had an idea, we wanted to change our exercise or we wanted to add in vegetables. Um, sometimes we're two ways about a decision about making a behavior change. And that can be challenging. So this is a, called a decision balance chart. And what it does is it takes you through the pros and the cons of making a behavior change. And it's really nice because it makes you look at what's the, what's the pro of staying the same? Because sometimes what you'll find is you might not want to, this behavior might not be what you want to change. And this can really help you move to realize you don't want to change or that this is actually a place that really makes sense. But it can help you work through those uh, pros and cons of making a behavior change. So now that we've talked about how we might make a behavior change and all that information that Dr. Gilbert gave you and Karen gave you, you might be seeing some things that you could set in a goal. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about your diabetes team and how you might want to involve them in your care. And as you see, Dr. Gilbert's right central in as an endocrinologist, that could be a very important person as part of your team. And there might be some people I haven't even mentioned on your team. One thing is, is if you're seeing someone and they know you have diabetes, you're probably seeing them for your diabetes. But there is a lot of healthcare providers you might need to tell them that you have diabetes. So it might be your dentist might need to know a little bit more about that. Um, your, your eye doctor, when you get your glasses checks, might need to know a little bit more. So involving them in your care and making it a team that works for you. You can see here we have the dietitian. So um, there's dietitians, there's exercise physiologists, there might be a social worker. Emotional health is 
you know, very important to having balance and being able to make behavior change. But remember, who you put on your team is your choice. So what would these people do for being on your team? And in this little cloud that I've uh, set up is that there's all these different things. They could be listening to you. They could be offering you support um, through education, just like you're learning tonight. They might offer you even past just the education, but the application of it by meeting one-on-one -on -one with the dietitian. You might also want to, um, you know, talk about uh, your foot care with your family doctor. And then as Dr. Gilbert said, you might be referred to someone because you're having trouble cutting your nails. So that could be very uh, timely and might be supportive for you in getting better management. But there's a lot of people that can teach you new information, new skills, and, you know, those checkups. And what can be really helpful there is that checkup is quite important when you meet with your family doctor, or your endocrinologist, because they're really, when you do your lab work, you're doing a check-in and all those self-management skills you have been using, how are they working? Okay, so you did some work, you did, you did the activity, you learned from it, you sat down with your healthcare team, and they said, well, there might be some adjustments. You checked it, and you're adjusting to go through for the next three months. Other, other things that might be involved is even stress management, uh, having Pilates classes. There's a lot of different people who might be on your team. This slide, I just, you know, we talked about meeting with your team. We talked about the role of a, as a self-manager and coming up with a purpose and an, a plan and moving forward and doing it. It's not a straight line to success. There's a lot of bumps on the road and that that's important to note. And there's many people who have in all walks of life who have been very successful will tell you that there's bumps in the road, that people have to do a check-in, reevaluate and adjust to be able to succeed. Just as I was talking to you about what self-management is, I also wanted to tell you that in the clinical practice guidelines, there's key messages for people with diabetes. So you're in these guidelines, you could go read them and understand. And I just wanted to share with you, this is where it comes around, what does the team offer you? And some of the, we offer you a variety of education and support programs. You can have group classes, you might have stress management classes, as I said, there might be counseling sessions. You might have to, you know, relearning how to use a meter or a new phone app to help you with your management. In the guidelines, they do strongly recommend encouraging you to access diabetes self-management education and support. Definitely, there are many times in, our, in your lives of having diabetes that you will search out your team. At diagnosis, that can be a big time of learning and growing, as well as during times when there's changes in your diabetes uh, treatment, general health or life circumstances. When you work with your diabetes team, what is really happening here is you're establishing a trusting and collaborative relationship, setting goals for caring for your diabetes and your health, and identifying strategies to help you manage your diabetes. So remember baby steps, learning by doing, adjust from what you've learned, and there will always be bumps in the road, but embrace your imperfections. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for a very motivational and insightful uh, presentation. And I just want to say that I, I always uh, support the team and the concept of, I always like to say, baby steps lead to the greatest success. 
So thank you. So that concludes our formal uh, presentations for this evening. We'll now begin um, with some questions and I've been sort of watching the questions as they come in. So we invite you to submit questions to our panelists through the website. Um, and I'm just going to sort of direct and read out some of the questions. So let's start um, from the top. Okay. So is educating the younger generation about diabetes a part of the medical model now or in the future? I guess we can start, Dr. Gilbert, with what you think about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we can all recognize um, there's a reason that this is a frequently requested topic at speaker series, right? Um, diabetes is a growing epidemic um, and it's affecting younger and younger individuals um, and it's multifactorial. Part of it is our lifestyles are more sedentary, well, a lot more computer screens, especially over COVID. Um, part of it is cost of food. A lot of the foods that Karen was talking about are, are more expensive than the unhealthy foods. And that's also part of the crisis we're facing. So uh, I think given that um, type 2 diabetes is affecting younger and younger people, prevention is the key. Because uh, if we can prevent it, people from getting it, that's going to be our best way of tackling this uh, health care crisis. Thank you. Um, so is that, is there any medication that's updated in place of metformin? Yeah, I mean, um, depending upon which guideline you look at in the world. So the American diabetes and the European guidelines are now emphasizing for people who have kidney disease or established heart disease to kind of almost skip over metformin and go straight to the SJ2 inhibitor and GLP-1 receptor agonist class. In my own practice, I actually often combine metformin with SJ2 inhibitors. So drugs like Synergy and Zigduo are a combo pill. Um, metformin is still a good medication. Don't forget that, okay? It lowers A1C, it's safe, it has minimal side effects, easy to use. So it's still a, a cornerstone and many current guidelines still do recommend it, but because it does not actually alter the complications directly, only indirectly by lowering the sugars, it's not necessarily as popular as a first line staple like it used to be. I, I would just say you would have to discuss it with your healthcare provider. Thank you. And I think I'll direct these, sort of combine these two together. Lee, maybe you can answer these. What is the level of um, blood sugar that indicates diabetes and then once you have diabetes, what are good ranges for blood glucose to be in? Okay, thanks, Jill. Um, I'd say like, so diagnosing diabetes, you need two numbers. So we could have our fasting blood sugars of seven or above. So you can have a blood sugar of 7.1, or you could have it at, it could be higher than that, but it's definitely seven or above. Then we have two hours after eating or a random blood sugar above 11.1 or above. And then we also have the A1C test that is used and that um, is used to diagnose. And that is an A1C of 6.5% um, or above. So, but you need two tests. So you could have a fasting blood sugar that's 7.5 and an A1C of 6.5 and you would be diagnosed with diabetes. Thank you. So the and other question. Once you're diagnosed with diabetes, what are good ranges for blood sugar tests and do blood sugars vary from morning to evening? Blood sugars vary even more than morning to evening. They vary uh, all through the day. Um, when we're eating, when we're not eating, if we've been exercising, a lot of variables happen that uh, uh, make our blood sugars vary. Um, they, sorry, uh, the ranges are we're looking at between uh, four and seven, most of the time before meals. And that would be fasting in the morning or three to four hours after you've eaten. And then we might, if we're looking at two hours after eating, which is from the time you start eating. So if you start eating at eight in the morning and at two hours, we'd want it between five and 10. 
But that says there's a big but there is if your A1C is actually above seven, we're actually going to want you to be between five and eight. Saying all that, it comes down to individual pieces too, that some of this is a discussion with your team and knowing where your blood sugar sits. So I think that, you know, meeting with the team can be really helpful in um, figuring out what works, what's working for you. But most of the time, we're, this is the numbers we are looking for. Great, thank you. So this question I'm gonna read out, uh, most likely for you, Dr. Gilbert. There exists an abundance of scientific information identifying glucose spikes as dangerous or damaging to organs vessels. Um, what magnitude of postprandial glucose spikes from baseline pre-meal is considered dangerous? Two millimoles, three millimoles? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, what we do know is that chronically high sugars lead to complications. I, I showed that throughout my talk. Um, but it's a, a fair point and an insightful observation by one of our participants to note that glycemic spikes have also do that. And um, what we've what we can kind of say is that glycemic variability, uh, highs and lows and yo-yoing and spiking, uh, independent of the A1C itself, has been shown now to lead to complications. In terms of the acceptable values, I would reiterate what Lee said. So what we're aiming for is pre-meals of sugars of four to seven and two hours after a meal under 10. So that would be kind of the acceptable rise in millimoles per liter of glucose. Great, thank you. Um... And I think we've sort of answered this question, what to do what to do to delay taking medication if you have pre-diabetes? Yeah, so great question. And uh, again, great idea, right? So if there's pre-diabetes, that means they're not diabetes yet by definition. And so what can we do to delay the, perhaps the onset or prevent it completely? The greatest evidence comes from a trial called the Diabetes Protection Program, which was conducted in the United States in people with prediabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. And they randomized people to metformin, which we just discussed, versus lifestyle modification, which we just discussed. And they wanted to know which one would prevent diabetes better. Good news was metformin reduced the development of type 2 diabetes by 31%, which is awesome but lifestyle modification reduced it by 59%. So if you had to pick one thing to do with prediabetes, the most important thing to uh, employ is what Lee and Karen talked about rather than what I talked about. Um, and that's really a focus on lifestyle modification. So in that study that involved 30 minutes of exercise five days a week, um, improved uh, dietary choices, a weight loss of about five to 10%. So uh, lifestyle modification is the key. Sometimes that is difficult to accomplish and medications like metformin could be also beneficial as I just mentioned, uh, but the focus in prediabetes should still be on reducing complications in a variety of different ways and lifestyle modification. Thank you. Karen, here's a couple of questions for you. There is a growing body of science supporting that fat consumption and fat and hence fat accumulation in our human cells and organs is the root cause of insulin resistance. While fat intake will not spike glucose after eating, it aggravates the root cause of type two diabetes being insulin resistance. Hence, many studies have started to support the view that greatly reducing your fat intake, so plant and animal sources, notably increases your insulin sensitivity. Can you comment on this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think ultimately we have to understand that fat accumulation or how our body processes the different sources of energy it is very different and complicated. So it's really challenging to say that if you eat more fat, then you accumulate more fat because I don't think that's how it works. It's not how it works. So um, that being said, insulin resistance is definitely something that can impact our blood sugars and therefore our diabetes control. And we would say that um, actually doing more physical activity can be helpful in reducing the insulin resistance, as well as having a more balanced, right? Not just fats. I know I talked about fats today, but certainly we wanna still include other sources of our energy like carbohydrates and, and proteins and vegetables. Uh, into our, our meals and into our eating so that we don't have that, you know, spike and um, 
uh, sort of uh, difficulty managing our blood sugars when we are also dealing with insulin resistance. So I hope that helps. Another question for you, Karen, can you give some examples of sort of uh, bad foods like highly processed uh, foods, dairy, ultra processed plant-based foods? Yeah, so I, I would say the ultra plant-based, ultra processed plant-based foods are those, um, you know, vegetarian sausages or vegetarian hot dogs, burgers, and that kind of thing that we're really seeing a lot of. I'm not going to mention any brand names here, of course, um, but I think we all have seen that in, in commercials, you know, um, and in terms of highly processed dairy, there would be things like cream cheese or um, very processed cheese sauces. Those would be the types of uh, highly processed dairy that uh, we were sort of pointing towards. And another question for you is you talked about canned tuna and salmon, is that a healthy choice? And how many times a week would you suggest eating canned fish for a healthy um, diet and omega-3s? So the concern with canned items, especially canned fish is the amount of sodium, which can, if we are consuming too much, they can raise our blood pressure um, significantly. And so we wanna maybe choose some uh, lower, uh, sodium versions, which do exist. Unfortunately, they never go on sale. Um, so it, it's challenging if we're also working with the food budget. So if we can't get the un lower sodium um, uh, versions of canned fish, then we might consider once a week because of the high sodium intake of the canned fish. Um, but if we can choose the lower sodium versions, which are quite safe in terms of the amount of sodium, then we could actually potentially have that two or three times in the week very safely. Great. Um, Dr. Gilbert, how do you decide when a family doctor is good enough to manage diabetes or when an endocrinologist is needed? Um, this particular question is uh, challenging because um, someone's struggling with their blood sugars, they're nine to 14 and an 88 year old senior. Um, and the only treatment option sort of that's next in line, it looks like is insulin. And does that mean it's time for an endocrinologist? Yeah, so it's a great question and lots of points there. I would say, first of all, that um, about approximately one in every 10 people in the province of Ontario has diabetes. And we have about 100 to 150 endocrinologists in the province. So if you do the math, there is no way that every person with diabetes can be followed by an endocrinologist. This is a condition to be managed by family medicine, not endocrinologists. The challenge is that different family doctors have different comfort levels in managing diabetes. And some like to refer to endocrinologists very early and some are very comfortable. So in this scenario, an 88 year old woman who likely needs insulin, there are certainly many family doctors that would be very comfortable to manage that. On the other hand, there may be some some family doctors that are less comfortable and would refer to an endocrinologist. So it's not um, one size fits all as who should be managed, but rather the healthcare provider should feel comfortable and confident in managing the condition. And certainly not everybody needs to be managed by an endocrinologist. Thank you. And do any diabetes medications have an impact on reduced sex drive or performance? So um, the medications that are used to manage diabetes in and of themselves do not impact uh, libido or sexual performance, or, et cetera. However, the diabetes condition itself can. And I didn't have time to go through every single complication of diabetes, but uh, erectile dysfunction in men and as well in women, um, some sexual dysfunction can exist. So this is uh, you know, really a phenomenon of both genders. And uh, it is a concern. Probably the best treatment again is managing the diabetes to control sugars the best you can. Uh, impaired libido also is often multifactorial. So there could be other reasons for low libido like stress. Um, and that comes into Lee's discussion around management and, and uh, behaviors to help kind of promote healthy living um, that can help improve sexual function, not in and of itself from diabetes alone. 
uh, again, going back to the original question, diabetes medications per se are not the issue, but rather probably a sign that there is diabetes and it could be the diabetes that is one perhaps of many other contributing factors. Thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Gilbert, are there any medical people or uh, Lee as well, who specialize in diagnosing foot issues caused by diabetes? Or is this for a general practitioner? I'm not confident my GP is able to manage circulation problems and numbness. Okay, I'll start and then Lee can add to it, I guess. Um, so it, it somewhat depends upon what the problem is in the feet, right? So if it's more of a neuropathy problem, perhaps a neurologist would be involved. If it's more of a vascular issue like blood flow and circulation, it could be a vascular surgeon that's involved. If there's ulcer development, often wound nurses are involved and perhaps infectious disease doctors get involved. That's why I highlighted on my slide that it often is a multi a disciplinary team for foot care, that it's usually not one group, not even one set of physicians. The other thing is that uh, podiatrists or chiropodists are also very helpful, um, an orthopedist, to ensure that the proper orthotics, footwear, um, calluses, nail, uh, ingro avoiding ingrown toenails that could contribute to ulceration are also part of it. So it's a long answer because there's so many different players here. Foot care is uh, a major health concern for people living with diabetes. And that's why, again, it's incumbent uh, on the person living with diabetes to really manage it and not rely upon all those healthcare professionals that I mentioned. But if there is a health care concern on the foot, then we try and um, refer the person to the best person possible, depending upon what the issue is. I don't have anything to add, Jeremy. I think that was pretty thorough. <laughs> Well, it looks like that is um, all the questions for tonight. So we've come to the conclusion. Um, thank you all for your participation. These have been fabulous questions and hopefully have given you some answers and, and we've given you some strategies to manage diabetes. Please remember to take a moment to fill out the electronic evaluation form. It really does help plan for speaker series in the future, gives us ideas for topics, what are your areas of interest. Um, so it's key so that you can, you can continue on in your learning. You can also have your name added to the, Sunday, to the um, Sunnybrook um, speaker series mailing list if you're not already on it. Um, for more information about upcoming sessions, um, when we return in January. I'd like to once again thank our speakers for a very informative evening, Dr. Jeremy Gilbert, Karen Fung, and Lee Kaplan. Kaplan. Thank you to Carol Annette from the Sunnybrook Board of Directors for providing tonight's welcome. And a big thank you to all of you for joining us virtually this evening. There will be a recording of this session on the Sunnybrook Speaker Series website for your reference. So pass it on to, to friends or family members if they wanna have a, have a watch. And thanks again for being here. Please have a wonderful evening and stay healthy, everyone. And thank you, Jill, for moderating. What a great job, amazing. Thanks, Jill.